Okay, I'd like to um, welcome everybody to Mars. Who's been to Mars before? Most of you, some of you, good. Um, so I mean, Mars is really interested in this space because um, we are dedicated to entrepreneurship and innovation. And we've been working for about the past year with the Accessibilities Directorate uh, for the province of Ontario in um, promoting the Accessibilities for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, which is a body of legislation that has, um, has come into effect in the last year or so for, um, for public and now, and now private institutions. And we're interested in looking at this space not only just for compliance, but in business growth and innovation and how we can use that as a catalyst, um, a catalyst for growth for, uh, for companies. Um, thanks for your patience. This is the first time we've had the best practices down in the studio here, but we're closer to the video cameras and the bright lights, so it makes it easier for things for production on our end. Um, and we're packed today. Every room is being used, so, uh, so thanks for your patience. We've even got people in the overflow room in the back, so I can kind of wave at them through the camera. Um, so thanks for your patience, and the, the, uh, the, be the best practices in this series, the social innovation series, uh, will also be in this room, as far as I've been told, so, um, so you can expect that. Um, so I'd like to introduce our, uh, our first speaker, Yuta Trevoranis. She's the director of uh, Inclusive Design Research Center uh, and a professor with the Faculty of Design at OCAD University. And uh, you should on your, on your chairs have copies of the Abilities magazine. Uh, and she contributes to this or has for the last two issues. There's one on the master's program at OCAD uh, for inclusive design. And there's another one here which is, um, I mean she'll do justice in a moment, but talking a bit about using cloud computing to help people with disabilities. So um, the IDRC, the Inclusive Design Research Center, is an internationally recognized center of expertise in the inclusive design of emerging information and communications technology and practices. Utah has led many international multi-partner research networks that have created broadly implemented technical innovations that support inclusion. Utah and her team have pioneered personalization as an approach to accessibility in the digital domain. Her team also leads many international open source projects that attempt to infuse inclusive user experience design sensibilities into open source networks. She has played a leading role in developing accessibility legislation, standards, and specifications internationally. So please join me in welcom welcoming Utah Trevoranis. I'm going to add one additional shameless pitch to that great introduction, and thank you. And that is, uh, since we're here in the in the Mars building, there's another document that you might want to look at, which is the um, Releasing Constraints Report, which we did with the Martin Prosperity Institute. Oh, and my talk. Uh, you should, yeah, just <laughs> right. Okay. It should be there. Uh. Oh. Okay. One second. Uh, just click on behind right there. But that's not it. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Okay, good. <laughs> Here we go. Good. So I've, um, I've titled my talk, The Bright Economic Future of Inclusive Design. And the clouds are quite apropos because I just came in from California on the red eye. So I've been flying through the clouds and landed this morning, took a shower and raced over here to give the talk. So excuse my state. Um, but we've already had an introduction to the Inclusive Design Research Center. One thing I want to add is that we have a wealth of resources and tools to support inclusive design. And they're all open source and open access in a way that they are free to commercialize. So anybody can take them, you can commercialize them, you can sell them, et cetera. The URL for the um, IDRC is idrc.ocad.ca. And what we call inclusive design is design that is inclusive of the full range of human diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, gender, age, and other forms of human difference. And basically what we're talking about is designing for diversity. And our approach, uh, the IDRC's approach to this, is to address the beginnings of, of the um, ICT or information and communication technology food chain in that we're trying to produce authoring tools, uh, toolkits, supports that software producers and ICT producers can then use to create products as opposed to creating uh, or addressing each of the individual products ourselves. 
We also have um, an Inclusive Design Institute, which is a regional research hub, which involves eight of the uh, ma major post-secondary institutions in the area. And so that's, that's the end of the shameless pitch. What I do want to talk about is this bright economic future for inclusive design, because um, one of the reasons I'm so out of breath and one of the reasons why I've had to squeeze this in is all of a sudden we are um, noticing globally that there is this demand for inclusively designed products and services. And there's also a rising demand for personnel with skills and knowledge in, in inclusive design. And why is this taking place? Of course, one of the reasons we're here is because of the AODA, but the AODA is not alone. There is a legislative trend globally. Um, in the U.S., we have things like the 508 Refresh, which is a, a pr procurement legislation. If you want to sell anything um, to publicly funded institutions in the U.S., you have to meet 508 regulations, and those regulations are being refreshed. We have the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Persons with Disabilities, and that's been ratified by more countries than any other U.N. convention, and that means that that almost every um, trading partner within that of Ontario and of the businesses within Ontario will have some form of legislation to say if you want to um, sell products to us, they have to be inclusively designed. Another recent one is the U.S. 21st Century Communication and Video Accessibility Act, which uh, relates to media, digital media, and of course. Um, there are these political agendas, which you will see. There was a recent report that was released in the U.S. to show that the U.S. is losing $55 billion a year uh, to dig what's called digital e exclusion. And w why is this in the political limelight? Um, access to online systems is no longer an option. Um, there is a huge estimated social and economic cost of digital exclusion because it's required for government, commerce, education, employment, recreation, social engagement, civic engagement. If you look at monster.ca, you'll see that even janitorial jobs will require an online application. So in order to participate in society, you have to be online. And there are, of course, barriers to, to online participation. At the same time as this is happening, we have the aging of the Western world, and you've probably heard all of the um, press around this. And it's based upon fairly um, unavoidable statistics. Um, this is, I'm giving you a very, very extremely conservative view of this. Um, what I've taken is only the uh, disabilities that will impact on your ability to access a computer. So this does not include someone who's in a wheelchair and can, can uh, et cetera, or some, I mean, disabilities that don't impact on digital exclusion. If you look at it, as we age, it gets, um, to the point where at 75 and plus, we, you have a 64% chance of having a disability that will mean that you cannot access a standard computer. If you look at the percentage of the population as we age, um, it is the, more than the majority when uh, the baby boomers, and how many people here are over 45? Okay, the majority. <laughs> um, so you are all going to um, be part of this demographic. And it isn't only about the fact that you are going to require inclusively designed products and services. There's another story to this, and that is that we have, it, it affects the labor gap. There's a huge labor gap about to happen, and that labor gap is not equally distributed. It has far greater impact than the numbers, in that it's the most crucial and critical parts of our labor market that will be affected, that will all of a sudden lose people to disability or to retirement. And there's a lot of corporations that are hoping to address this issue by making sure that those employees can continue to work. There's also a lot of information, and I'm going to go through these very quickly, sorry for the brevity, about um, why we do better when we're equal, when a, a society is inclusive. And th it's not, it not only impacts um, those individuals, but it, it, it impacts on our health spending. The society as a whole is healthier. Um, we are happier. <laughs> we have less m uh, mental problems. We have less crime. We have less obesity. We have, if a society is uh, designed inclusively and if everybody can participate in the social fabric. Also, there's a lot of information about how wonderful diversity 
and inclusive design and inclusion and designing for diversity are on innovation. Um, and uh, it, it's just it suffice it to say that true innovation really occurs at the margins. And that's if we have this um, innovation gap. And uh, one of the things that Canada has scored lowest on, in fact, we're 17th place, which is qu fairly shameful um, compared to other comparable nations, is in innovation. Um, we should look to uh, recent reports by people like Scott Page, which talks about diversity trumps ability. If you have a diverse group, um, if the, the more diverse your group is, the more effective they are in problem solving, better decision making and planning, more accurate prediction, and definitely greater innovation. But um, the one thing that we do know as well is that the current business models that we have are not working. Um, at I, and I'm talking in the information and communication technology sector and in that digital inclusion exclusion area. Standard information and communication technology developers designed for the typical or average user. And legislation, policy, and everything is constructed such that assistive technology is supposed to bridge that gap. But that bridge is crumbling because the uh, developer of things like screen readers or uh, refreshable braille displays or on-screen keyboards, those things that allow people that can't use standard access systems to access a computer, need to work with each and every application on that computer. The, the platform, the um, our operating system, the browsers, the email applications, the many mashed up apps that are there, and how many of you have upgraded a software program in the last week? Okay, every time there's an upgrade or an update, that um, assistive technology has to be upgraded and updated. And so what's happening is the, uh, the assistive technology market cannot keep up. And the other thing is that these are small, medium em enterprise companies. The better they do their job, meaning the, the more they meet the individual diverse needs of each user, the smaller their, their customer base. The other issue is that we're addressing only some disabilities because, of course, they need to address the biggest customer base. And so a lot of people are left out. And we're only reaching 28% of the world. In 28, in, only in 28% do we ha of the world do we have access to assistive technology. For the rest of the world, it's either not sold, it's not maintained, um, or it costs more than 50% uh, of your annual income. So we all use technology every day. A person at a library computer. A person using a mobile phone. A person buying a train ticket. And we're using it to do more things all the time. Library card catalog becomes a computer. Some of the things we used to do face to face, we now do with automated systems. Ticket booth becomes a ticket machine. For most of us, those systems are okay most of the time. And when there are problems, we can find a way to get along. Glare on ticket machine screen. Hand shields the screen so it can be read. But those of us with disabilities often run into situations where the technology doesn't work well enough to meet our abilities. Person with low vision sees a blurry ticket machine screen. In some cases, we can use assistive technology to bridge the gap. Assistive technology, or AT, can provide text for speech. Video chat with captions. Turn text into speech. The weather today will be mostly sunny or make words on a screen easier to read. Computer login screen in high contrast. Whatever the user needs to accomplish a task. Unfortunately, we don't all have the assistive technology we need, and we can't always take it with us to use anywhere we want. Imagine if you could pick up any device anywhere, and it would automatically adapt to you. Person picks up device and it changes size. Imagine someone who is usually confused by technology. Now every computer looks like their personal device. Simple, with just the controls and features they need. Complicated computer screen changes to a simple version. Imagine a student who has to use computers in different labs and classrooms. If all of them worked exactly as needed. Student in two classrooms, each computer becomes accessible as she needs it. There's a way to offer accessibility solutions to more people in more situations. We call it the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure, or GPII. The GPII will use the cloud, the electronic networks that power most of our information services, and the intelligence in electronic products themselves. 
cloud with server symbols and dotted lines show information flow. Right now, we use the cloud to store information, transmit it to the right destination, and convert it from one form into another. Information moves into, around, and back out of the cloud to various devices. The GPII will take the same cloud idea and use it to support accessibility. Users will start with a wizard that helps them choose how they want their personalized interface to look and work. Person at computer making selections. And store that profile in the cloud so that it's available from then on. Profile information flows into the cloud. Accessibility developers will create tools for the toolbox that address those needs. Accessibility software flows into the cloud. The GPII will store information about devices, their uses and features. Device information flows into the cloud. Then, when a user needs an accessibility feature, the GPII will take the right user profile and features, check the device, and guide the device in using its own features to meet the user's needs. Accessibility information flows from the cloud to the phone, screen changes to large print. The GPII will automatically apply the right tool to whatever device the person is using, wherever it is. So the interface will work the right way. The same person now sees large print on a train ticket machine. The GPII will be great for users. It will support independence with enabling technology. When you need it, where you need it, how you need it. There's no need to explain, negotiate, or justify anything. It just works. All of the information will be kept private and secure. A traveler gets the right interface at airport check-in. Information kiosk and the seat back display on the plane. The GPII will be great for society. It will offer wider participation in education, employment, commerce, and our communities. Many people on a street with a school, offices, stores, and community center. The GPII will provide developers with the tools and parts they need to develop AT more easily and at lower cost. Developers can then upload their products to the GPII marketplace, quickly making them available globally. Developer creates new AT, uploads it to the cloud, and people around the world access it. The GPII will give mainstream technology companies an easy way to match accessibility features to their products and services as they're being designed. Product designers upload its features to the cloud. Where professional services are needed, the GPII will give counselors, therapists, and educators more options for evaluation and management. Client and therapist work together on the wizard. The GPII will let schools, libraries, and other public locations serve everyone more easily. Every user will get the interface they're already familiar with. The weather today will be mostly sunny. Library computer shows low vision interface, then screen reader interface for two different users. Employers will be able to accommodate new employees. They can promote and relocate employees without having to reconfigure or reinstall a lot of technology. Employee gets promoted, new workstation automatically has the accessible interface. The GPII will offer a new way of providing accessibility when, where, and how it's needed. Okay, and apologies that the size of the screen didn't fit the, um, here. So um, this is the digital inclusion solution that we're trying to create globally uh, to address this issue and to address the fact that the current business models don't work. Um, it's a one-size-fits-one inclusive design, and therefore it's very much in line with other IT design initiatives. Y if you look at personalization, mass customization, you probably, driving down the, the highway, you'll see this, this term one-size-fits-one. Um, and of course, it's more and more possible if we're dealing with digital systems, we're dealing with digital delivery. 
Um, you can see the entire video at gpii.org. The one thing I want to say is the GPII is not a single entity, a, a single technical uh, or technical solution, a single set of tools, or a single architecture, but it's a global initiative with a large diversity of participants. But already there are many um, jurisdictions globally that are, are attempting to participate, or that will be supporting it and are participating. And if we look at why it's gaining such uh, political attention, it addresses a whole number of the things that ail us um, in North American society and Western society, but also globally. Uh, this is used to address the education crisis um, because it recognizes that learners learn differently and we need diverse learners. We no longer need human hard drives, human calculators, etc. We need a, a huge uh, diverse pool of labor. Uh, it's addressing literacy um, because it allows for that scaffolding and assistance in literacy. But the most interesting thing is that economists like this. For whatever reason, um, we have uh, the, the friendship and the participation and, and support of economists because one of the things that we're currently in is we're in an extreme push market. Um, so that means that there's a very high, high cost of startup. Most of what people are consuming once you take away housing is actually stuff they're persuaded they need, which means that any new, pr new supplier or producer has to invest most of their income in marketing and communication, not in developing the product, not in new innovation. And it's almost impossible for anyone to break into the market. Um, and there's a winnowing of products, in fact, as uh, as opposed to what you would think, and that is a diversification of products, because everybody has to go for the largest market, and therefore they compete with each other. What we're doing is we're shifting this to a pull market, where you, um, because of the pipeline, you don't need to invest a lot in marketing and, and, dissemin um, and commercialization. And we're encouraging individuals to express their individual, diverse individual needs, which then pulls a diversity of supply and product, a more resilient market business environment, and it encourages the participation of small enterprises, new entrepreneurs, and indie developers. It allows pooling resources so that we have cumulative ad as opposed to competitive development and innovation. Um, it allows um, there to be this direct connection to a very large, diverse global market um, we address, therefore, also this innovation gap in um, that its new innovative ideas can break into the market, uh, which then, of course, has the impact of addressing youth unemployment. Young entrepreneurs and SMEs have a chance to enter the market, no need for large uh, infrastructure or capital investment, and so there's a new s support for new ideas and approaches. And there's even a waste reduction policy um, benefit in that uh, there are programs in various cities that are implementing this as a how to reach me program. So you, c you as a citizen of that city can declare if you want to give me information about emergency or how which green box to use at what time or um, how my taxes are, are being affected, then reach me by email, by large print brochure or by telephone and therefore there's less waste of all of those brochures that end up in the garbage. And of course, um, we are hoping to support AODA compliance um, and use this to uh, uh, use to reformulate, in fact, and recast AODA as an economic driver because the AODA is getting international attention because it is innovative legislation in that we are treating. Um, accessibility not as a litigation issue where the individual that is wronged has to go after the the uh, wrongdoer it's the province and so it uh, that is um, enforcing the accessibility requirements and so this we have the attention globally of other jurisdictions which want to look towards this model so we already have the global attention and now we have the opportunity to um, show that Ontario, in fact, is the place to go for inclusive design and for accessible products. So questions and suggestions. And sorry for the brutal brevity <laughs> because we only have 20 minutes. So, so how far have you come along in, in the development of the GPII? Have you kind of published like a, 
manifest or anything like that. <laughs> right. So we have, okay, that's a very good question. We have a number of pilot projects that implement this, but the, the cloud infrastructure is uh, um, just now being developed. We have a project within the learning space called Flow, Flexible Learning for Open Education, which allows the declaration of learner individualized learner needs and then the matching of curriculum resources to it. We actually have a background project called, oh sorry, you know, I was supposed to restate this, the question. The question was how far along are we with the GPII? Um, we have we actually have a historic project called web for all which was part of the connecting canadians initiative which unfortunately the federal government cut somewhere um, before 2005 which implemented this in multi um, user workstations and in the uh, cap sites the community access points so you carried your profile with you on a smart card on a usb stick and then uh, whatever um, multi-user workstation in a library or, or um, in a community center you approached, it would automatically set itself up to meet your particular needs. Um, the, the good news is we have uh, Euro European Commission funding. The, it is part of the uh, US um, 2012 budget. Uh, it's part of the FCC broadband plan in the US. Um, it is uh, being supported by UNESCO, so there's uh, global support and different pieces of it. There's a whole security team, there's a privacy team, there's um, a growing global community. It started here in Ontario, it was developed here in Ontario, and so the, the, the interesting thing is that we as Ontario have an opportunity to continue to lead this uh, particular initiative. Is there a leader of the, this thing, or is it a just, as you mentioned, a big collaborative effort with a right. whole lot of people involved? Is yeah. there a leader? Well, the co directors of it are myself and uh, Greg Vanderheiden, who is the uh, director of the Trace Center in Wisconsin. But that that's somewhat misleading in that there's a lot of leaders. I mean, this is not something that you have a leader of, it's, it's a large consortia. There's a lot of private sector, all of the big companies are also obviously involved. Anyone that has any technology to do with cloud computing is involved. Um, there are many, many consumer groups. And if you go to the website, you can see um, all of the, the different organizations that are part of this. Maybe one more question? I'll use it. The website, is that the GPII? GPII.org is a, is a good website to go to. You can also go to idrc.ocad.ca. Inclusive Design Research Center, so idrc.ocad, O-C-A-D, which uh, we're at ocaduniversity.ca. Okay. Great. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks. Thanks. So the, uh, there were some great images there. I like the red... Um, images there that the, uh, the show the inter interaction between the demographics and disabilities, how that changes over time. Uh, this presentation, plus the video, I hope, will be up on the Mars website, usually posted about a week after, as will the video of the talk and some shorter videos of Yuta talking about um, what we call hot tips for entrepreneurs. So, you know, two minute videos of little, little blurbs. So, uh, so all these references and websites will be up there so you can check them later. Um, so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Eddie Forsyth, Edie Forsyth, the Corporate Director of Accessibility Experts, which is the leading authority on the sweeping changes that the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act is imposing on the way we conduct customer service in this province. In her previous role as Executive Director of Durham Regional Employment Network, uh, Edie has insight into the many barriers persons with disabilities face in searching for employment. Her connections across Ontario enable her to continually be informed of the upcoming standards and their legislative requirements and the ongoing needs of people with disabilities. Eddie Forsyth. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm here to talk about the Accessible Customer Service Standard under the AOD, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. And hopefully I can help you as a business try and get ready for this piece of legislation. So I'm gonna go over a few of the disability types and some of the statistics. 
and also talk about the Accessible Customer Service Standard and the other four standards that will be coming up and what you can do as a business to start making your organization accessible and implement these uh, standards. So why on earth is the Government of Ontario doing something for people with disabilities? When we look at the statistical data, 1.8 million Ontarians have some form of a disability. So that's 15.5% of the population, which is a significant number. Those numbers increase as we age. Once we hit the age of 65, 47% of us will have some form of a disability. And then there's the baby boomers, which uh, Judo was uh, talking about also. So anybody born between the ages of, or the years 1946 to 64, we are the baby boomers. And we will be the largest population growth ever. There will be more uh, people over the age of 65 than there will be youth. In 2026, the Government of Canada is estimating that 16% of the population will have some form of a disability. Well, here in Ontario, we're already at 15.5%. That could have something to do with the way we gather information and what our definition in Ontario is of disabilities. In Canada, you may recall in 2006, we had census data we had to fill out. And it was a, a form we filled out about our information. And one of the questions was, are you a person with a disability, yes or no? Many people do not check that box off seeing themselves as being disabled. Uh, my father, for instance, my dad is 80 years old. He's had uh, triple bypass surgery, he has congestive heart failure, he has a pacemaker, but my, my dad still goes to the gym three times a week and there is no way he would check that box off saying he's a person with a disability. And other people just don't even really want to self-identify that they have a disability. So um, those numbers here of the 15.5% are probably much higher than, uh, than the 16% that Canada is suggesting. And 16% for 2026 is a number of years away. But our definition in Ontario is very broad and I'll go through them shortly. <coughs> The other significant uh, point here is the spending power of people with disabilities. In, on, in Canada, it's 21 to $25 billion a year. So as a business, you want to make sure that you're tapping into that market. Sorry, is that uh, purchases of people with disabilities? Yes, All purchases or just uh, uh, disability goods and services? Uh, I would say all people with disabilities. So for all of those reasons, the Government of Ontario decided they were going to do something for people with disabilities. And this is our definition in Ontario of what disabilities are. So physical disabilities, right from somebody using a wheelchair or a walker or a mobility device, but also hidden disabilities like my father that you may not necessarily see. Hearing, so deaf and uh, deaf and uh, low, or low hearing, vision, all the way from low vision to total blindness, deaf blind, an individual that is both deaf and blind, speech, uh, mental health, so three categories there, behavior, anxiety, and mood disorders, and also learning disabilities. And then also intellectual disabilities, so that's a person's ability to think or reason. There's sensory, so taste, smell, and touch. There's also other conditions such as cancer, diabetes, asthma, and allergies are also covered under this, and then temporary disabilities. So if you've twisted an ankle or you've had eye surgery, any of those are also included under this definition. Is everybody surprised at how many dis different disabilities there are covered under this legislation? Uh, can everybody here think of somebody that they know that has a disability, whether it be a colleague or a friend or a neighbor or a family member? Can everybody think of somebody? Can you raise your hand, please, if you can? Okay. Thank you very much. So basically, everyone in the room knows somebody that is a person with a disability. This is not just a statistic. This affects all of us. So this legislation under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act um, has a huge goal. They want to make sure that all of Ontario is accessible by the year 2025. That's a pretty big undertaking. Um, 
how would we even go about doing that? Where do we even begin? Well, we'll have to put some sort of standards in place so that we can say if an organization has checked off this box and this box, they are showing that they are in compliance for each of those standards. And that's what the government has done. They've implemented five standards. The other important thing here is we've had legislation before and, and it's still sitting there, the Human Rights Code and the Ontarians for Disabilities Act, but there's never been any enforcement. And this time there are fines associated. Every organization that is not in compliance can be fined, can be up to $100,000 per day and $50,000 per board director. The AODA, yes? Is this by 2025 or uh, with the customer service standard, you have till January 1st, 2012 to implement that, and that will apply on each of the standards, uh, yes, starting with the accessible customer service standard. Um, in regards to the customer service, it's not really you have to implement accessible customer service, is you have to show that you have a plan to implement customer service, which is a big difference. No, you have to actually implement the accessible customer service standard by January 1st. I'll go into that in the next slide so that we can see what that's going to look like. Uh, the AODA applies to the public sector, the private sector, and nonprofit organizations. So virtually every organization and business in Ontario. Uh, there are five standards altogether, the first one being the customer service standard that is currently law, but there are four more standards coming up. There will be three that will be coming out shortly, and that's number two, three, and four that will be integrated as one standard. So the information and communication standard, the way we provide information and the way we communicate to people with disabilities. The employment standard is all about recruitment, retainment and accommodation of individuals in their workplace and transportation will be around accessible transit and then eventually we'll have the built environment standard and this is the big monster everybody is scared of and thinks that they have to do right away but they don't the built environment standard will be new build forward unless you're doing major renovations so any new building that you're doing you will have to ensure eventually that it is accessible is everybody clear on that? Okay. So let's take a look at the first standard because this is the one that you have to implement now and start working on. And it's all about the way we interact with various disabilities and how we provide goods and services to that individual. It requires that we have an accessible customer service policy, practice, and procedure. If you have 20 or more people in your organization, you will have to have written policies and procedures. You have to provide staff training to everyone, so your full-time, part-time, volunteer, board of directors. And you also have to ensure that if you have a consultant or agent acting on your behalf, you will have to ensure that they have had accessible customer service training. You don't have to necessarily provide it for them, but you'll have to ensure that they have had it. You also have to provide a feedback method so that people with disabilities can give their feedback and you want to take that feedback and do something with it. You have to provide information in alternative formats. Uh, you have to allow for service animals. You have to allow for a support person and you have to allow, allow individuals to bring in their assistive devices. And the last thing is you have to provide notice of service disruption. So if you are having a service disruption, for instance, if one of your elevators isn't working, you have to post a sign saying the reason for the disruption, the length of time for the disruption, and what the alternative is. That's a lot to take in all at once, but are there any questions on that? Okay. So. So the first standard is the Accessible Customer Service Standard. And I, I know everybody freaks out thinking, oh my God, I've got to put in ramps right away. I've got to put in accessible washrooms. And that is not the case at all. It's about providing good customer service and the way we interact with people with disabilities. And it doesn't have to cost a lot to do. Once you have your training in place and your policies and procedures written, here are some of the things you can do. Pay attention to your signage. You know, have good, clear signage. All of our slides here are done in Arial font. You can use Arial or Verdana. There's lots of white space in between. It's black on white, which uh, works very well. 
Another thing you can do is your price tags. A lot of times you'll see red and black and it's very difficult to read. You want white on black if possible. Your brochures, your, fly your flyers, you want to use the clear print guidelines. Make sure that they are easy to read for somebody with a disability and also offer them in all other formats. So if, for instance, somebody was blind, they may want to receive the information electronically so they can use their own software device to read it out loud to them. Uh, you can also provide things in large print, which doesn't cost a lot of money. You're just going to enlarge it. It can be electronically. Somebody may ask for an audio copy of something, or it may be as simple as reading information out loud to the individual, or having you write it down because they can't take that information and assimilate it or just simply drawing a picture. You want to make sure your exterior roots and your interior roots are free of clutter. Uh, make sure your aisleways have lots of room so that people can access your services. You want to have good wayfinding, so proper signage so that when somebody comes into your facility, can they find their way around. Hospitals are really moving forward with proper wayfinding because you come into a hospital, often you're injured or, or, or require assistance, and then having to walk excessively because it's not clearly laid out is not good wayfinding. You uh, could just simply have a, a chair in your business area so that somebody can sit down because they don't have the energy to stand or sit and wait. Uh, portable ramps can also be used. Uh, I've seen uh, we have in Oshawa a little store that is like a bakery and they just bring out a little ramp that they set in front because they know they have a gentleman that comes every day for coffee that has a wheelchair. So they put down a little temporary ramp for that individual to get in. Uh, make sure you provide assistance and I think this is the biggest thing. People with disabilities, all you need to do is ask the individual, how may I help you? And that person will let you know exactly what they need. Uh, I have a friend, Cindy, that's blind, and she likes to do her own grocery shopping, but of course she can't see anything. So what she does is she makes up a list of all her groceries, puts it in a Word document, she takes it to the Sobe store, goes to the customer service counter, hands her list over, and then they'll walk down the aisles and get all of her items for her. Now that's accessible customer service. Excuse me, I have a question. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it, it doesn't have to cost a lot. I think it's going to cost a lot because if you have a broad a, a range of definition of disability, because this customer service standard is going to be based on the definition of disability, right? I saw that you have uh, diseases like cancer or diabetic cases, so they have certain needs. So how are you... It's not just a matter of accessibility. So if you broaden the definition of a disability, how are you gonna address those needs? Well, like one thing you can do is offer services online so that the person doesn't have to come in and, and come to your store to purchase the item. Uh, even a hairdresser, say uh, your building's not accessible for that individual, could you go to their residence and provide that service there? Yes, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just want to add one thing. Yes. Um, there's actually been some research to show that there are cost savings if you use uh, inclusive design principles in ICT and in information and communication technology because it, it basically just means more flexible, updatable, uh, re-renderable it, it, uh, uh, applications and content. And so there was a, a Fairfax digital study. Uh, they actually tried to prove, they had uh, seven different holdings or uh, newspapers, digital newspapers, and they just picked one to see what would be the increased cost. They were trying to show that it, it would be an undue hardship, that it would cost quite a bit. What they actually discovered was it saved quite a bit of money because they could rebrand without, with almost no cost. They could, um, it was very easy to update. It reduced the, the bandwidth that was required and it made it much more efficient. So uh, there are, you know, we keep worrying about or being most concerned about the cost, but there are actually quite significant cost savings. And many of the costs that are there um, do increase the customer base. So if you look at the rollout of the, A of the ADA historically um, as background, although there were initial investments required, they, they more than paid, made up for it in terms of increased customer base. 
Thank you. Um, this is a shift in the way we're thinking. I mean, we built buildings way back in the 1600s and we had parliament buildings and courthouses and the more steps they had, the more power it showed. And now we're starting to see this is crazy, it's ludicrous. Eventually what we want to have is that all houses will be visitable, that there's just a, an easy slope right up to a house and that anybody can come visit anyone because everything will be accessible. And it's a huge goal and it's way off in the future, but it's shifting our attitudes and the way we see things. So here's five things that you probably need to do now. Um, you need to review the Accessible Customer Service Standard itself and look at what you need to do to be in compliance with that. And the first initial stage will to be to create your policies and procedures. And all of that is going to help you to eventually capitalize on the market that exists out there. You also want to educate and expand your ex expertise on all of the standards, all five of them, so that you're aware of what is coming up and what you need to do to eventually get there. Determine the level of accessibility in your facilities and plan to build no new barriers. You'll also want to start evaluating your website and look at that to make sure that uh, you have an accessible service delivery method there because a lot of people will use the website and the internet to find information and, and purchase. And keep accessibility top of mind for your staff and volunteers and everyone else with newsletters and tips. So Accessibility Experts Limited does offer training and consulting. We have a number of training options, a one hour, three hour. We have e-learning, we have train the trainer, and we also do accessible web design and accessible audits, and we call consult. So um, I've handed out a, a booklet on compliance and what you have to do, and my business card is there. And I hope that all of you shift your attitude towards making Ontario accessible. And a shift in the way we think takes time. We've had cultural shifts before in our lives. Uh, if you can roll your mind back to the 1970s, at that time, we were allowed to smoke anywhere we wanted. Do you remember that? You were allowed to smoke in your office, in your grocery store. The nurses smoked at their nurses station. Doctors, we did training for Ontario Hospital Association. The doctors smoked in the surgery rooms. Yes, they did. Remember our airplanes? We built in those little ashtrays right into the actual armrest. We could virtually smoke anywhere we wanted. And then we started to hear a bit of grumbling. People did not like the whole smoking idea. They, they, we were talking about secondhand smoke. So smokers had to go to a smoke room. Uh, I worked right over here at 700 University Avenue. That was my first job. And we had a smoke room. And people that smoked were always going down to the smoke room to smoke. Do you remember the uh, donut shops? They had those glassed in rooms. You actually went into them to smoke. And then we started to see a little bit more shift. Um, we started to see that, you know, there was limited spaces that you could smoke at, even in the restaurants. There was only a few sections that you could smoke in. The planes had a no smoking section and a smoking section. I don't know where that smoke went, but we all inhaled it still anyways. Mm -hmm. And then we started to see a bigger shift yet. Smokers were not allowed to smoke in buildings. They had to go outside to smoke. And there was this big hue and cry over that, but it, it happened. And then bingo halls and the bars. Remember that? They said no more smoking in the bingo halls, no more smoking in the bars. And now it's to the point where you can't even smoke in your own car if you have a child in it. And who would have thought 30 years ago that was going to happen? Well, folks, that's where we are right now. The same thing with this whole accessibility. We're just at the beginning stages taking those baby steps forward. But eventually, we will get there, and you guys will be the forerunners in that. So thank you. Do, do you want, uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. <laughs> or, uh... Any questions? Hello, my name yep, is Dave. It's really just more of a comment. I've been working around accessibility for a number of years, and when I talk to people about it, and I, I think of this yeah, idea, like this gentleman here was saying, it's going to be more expensive. And I said, it's like you were saying, shift your thinking. And it's this idea of, well, if you had a barrier that prevented everybody who was blonde from entering your yeah. business, you wouldn't have to be told to get rid of that yeah. barrier. 
you would know that it would be in your best interest to get rid of that barrier. You wouldn't need legislation. You would be saying, I can't lose those customers. Yeah. So I got to figure out a way to get rid of that barrier. And I think when, as you just showed on the screen, like you were saying, the red, the way that the population is shifting, what you have to think is you can't not do it, yeah. even if it initially costs you more. Yeah. Totally agree. We've, we've got to shift our thinking. And if, you know, we all know somebody that with a disability and ourselves as we age, unfortunately, we're probably going to be up there with that statistic. So if you're not going to do it for everyone else, do it for yourself. <laughs> and even people don't identify. Yes. Will benefit from better customer service. Yeah. Thank you. So the people that would be using the accessibility <coughs> access. Yeah. Are they organized in any fashion? Well, you know, it, there's accessibility advisory committees set up across the province. Every municipality with 10,000 or more people will have an accessibility advisory committee. And half those people on that committee have to be people with disabilities. So they know what their rights are. They're starting to get a voice. And they are definitely going to push that. A municipality, you say? Okay. Every oh. municipality and ever gov every government ministry with 10,000 or more people. So all hospitals, all school boards, all government ministries, and every municipality in Ontario has an accessibility advisory committee. Okay, and what are they asking for, really? Well, they are asking that we implement these standards and follow them through and make sure that, yes, Ontario becomes accessible by 2025. So, as so, so they know the this accessible the customer sa service standards coming up, so they know that they need to be treated fairly as a customer yeah. and provided the service that they're ask asking for. So this is really becoming political. I mean, you darn right it is. <laughs> 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 but it's completely in line with existing legislation. Yes. It is basically just providing greater detail to the human rights legislation. Yeah. So. And anybody here could be sued for the same sorts of things, but it, it's under litigation law. This is shifting it to something like public health or environmental law. So it, it and it's no, um, I mean, it's no more onerous or no more, there are no more requirements than what would be in our human rights legislation anyway. So is this to an incorporated company or sole proprietorship or? Every it, business in Ontario yeah. with one or more people. Each standard is somewhat different. There. Yes. <laughs> then there's the yeah, we got into the information communication standard. It's 50 or more. So there's all different categories for each standard. Uh, and is there a central repository of uh, explaining documents for that? Yes, there is. Um, you can go to my card. There's a whole bunch of links on there of, of okay. information. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Just last question. I've I, I just got a quick, uh, quick comment really because I I worked through disability discrimination acts in the UK and I worked with. Um, Many hundreds. Of you business, guys are really advanced down there, aren't you? So, in, so in some ways, in some ways, we were. But, but my comment really is because I, I think there's a lot of business people here who seem kind of a bit worried and concerned. And exactly the same thing happened in the UK. They thought we all thought this sky was going to fall. Mm -hmm. um, we were going to be crushed under under the legislation, and we were going to be sued left, right, and centre. And that that didn't actually happen. What happened was that businesses started looking at the act um, as it came in and saw it really as a business opportunity and that's what it that's what it can be and that's what it became and we found the business became more and more savvy at, at dealing with customers at hiring people with disabilities and actually started to speak to each other and and started yeah. communicating best practice and it helped to transform the system and i think one thing that any disability um, act does is it, cr it creates a foundation which we can a lot of work I've seen, because I lived in Vancouver from, for um, quite a few years, was because there's no act out in BC, good work just falls. Yeah. It, it, it disappears because there's no foundation. And we can take this as a foundation and build on it. And I've seen from a business perspective, a lot of business embrace um, disability acts. And you can really can benefit from yeah. it. So business make money, but it's, everything has been credible for business and for people with disabilities. And it, it benefits everyone, somebody with a stroller, an older person with mobility, it benefits everyone. If your place is easy to get into, you're more likely to shop there. And if you can shop there, you're bringing your friends and your family with you. Yes. And um, just to further, we call this the digital, well, in our area, we call it the digital curb cut. So if you look up Google electronic curb cut and you'll realize how many good ideas that we are could not do without today came about because uh, businesses were trying to 
address the needs of people with disabilities, including things, uh, unexpected things like email, et cetera. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Good, thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. So, um, as Edie said, you can go to her website. There's the AODA website in itself is an amazing resource. It's, it, it, there's checklists of the things you need to do. And, um, you know, in our work at Mars in, um, in uh, uh, bringing light to the, the legislation, we, we found that most businesses, a lot of this stuff people do anyway. It, it's, not a, it's not entirely new. It's not entirely out of left field. It's just good practice for customer service. Um, there are four um, kind of pillars underneath the act that will be rolled out over the next few years. So it's not all coming at once. The, the first one is the customer services uh, accessibility stuff. And that and this, those standards for private businesses come into effect on the 1st uh, of January 2012, right? Is that right? Yeah. Um, and again, that applies to everybody who has a business. If you're a sole consultant, you need to you need to be in compliance with the with all the, these standards, um, but as the emphasis has been, the real exciting thing is that this is not a net economic drain. The the Rotman study that Yuta was talking about earlier um, it showed two things. It showed first of all that at an individual level, changes in accessibility like this at at a, at a business level uh, was a net economic gain for the company or for the consultant. And the second thing it showed is that it was a net economic gain for the entire province uh, to the tune of, I can't remember what it was, but a few hundred dollars uh, per person GDP. So it was significant. So, so it's really a different way of thinking about how we can look at this as an opportunity. Uh, I think the smoking analogy uh, is very apt because in Toronto in particular, the bar owners were complaining that they lose all, all, lose all their business. And, you know, there was a period of adjustment, but of course they found that it attracted new customers and different customers. And uh, the money quickly came back into the system, uh, fuller than it did before. So I think that's actually a good analogy. Um, so speaking of which, I'd like to introduce our, our last speaker, Alexander Levy. Um, so two years ago, Alex started work as the only RA on a one-man U of T project uh, to prototype a faster, better, location-aware aid for people with communication challenges. This project went on to attract the support of Google, NSERC, and a host of other partners, eventually growing to become a 10-person team led by Alex. Now, the fruits of their efforts, an app and web service called My Voice, is a commercial product that is leading a new generation of smarter yet simpler communication aids. And uh, Alex was just telling me beforehand that um, his team won the University of Toronto uh, Inventors of the Year Award just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and actually, Alex and his team were here a few weeks ago, and uh, the Minister of Research and Innovation was here and kind of playing with the technology, and he was really, really liking it. Um, so, some words from Alexander Levy. Okay, so let's... Yeah, and if you could use that to sure. flip through, great. So first of all, let me please say... Uh, hey, hi. <laughs> Good afternoon. Right, anyway, uh, it, it's great uh, to, to be speaking after such wonderful speakers to such an informed audience. Uh, Edie and Yuda's presentations I thought were fantastic. Uh, and, and thanks very much uh, to Mars for inviting me to come speak. So uh, as was introduced, uh, I'm Alex Levy. I'm now the CEO and lead designer of a small little company called My Voice. And we make uh, an app that helps people with speech and language difficulties. So to give you a quick sense of what that means, I'll tell you some of who our users are. So there's sort of three main categories. The first are people who have uh, aphasia or apraxia. So this is because of uh, damage to the speech and language centers in the brain as a result of stroke, traumatic brain injury, brain cancer, and the like. So that's one area. Another area is developmental disorders. So these are people with potentially intellectual impairments or linguistic impairments, or also kids on the autism spectrum who are functionally nonverbal, but actually don't mind tapping out their feelings and desires through a device like this. And a third category uh, are people with neurodegenerative disorders, so ALS, and very famously, the most famous user of these types of devices is the physicist Stephen Hawking. So that, that's who we're for. So let me tell you what this presentation is about. Over the last year and a half, uh, my team and I have gone through four successive versions of, of this app. It started as a very, very basic prototype, and we kept advancing and advancing. And 
and really organically learned a lot about how to design for people with disabilities or special needs. And so I figured that this presentation would be good to give a practical example, passing on some design tips to show what we've learned and maybe to help you in, in your own designs with your own technologies. So for, before that all happens, I'd like to show you a video that uh, we've just uh, put the finishing touches on. We're actually launching the, the product that you just saw me very briefly demo uh, in, in, a, in, in four days. And we put together this great product launch video that actually also features the uh, Ontario Minister of Research and Innovation. So why don't I play that video for you, and then uh, we'll go into my design tips. Uh, oops, looks like we skipped the video. Do we have it back there? Or something? Let me see if I can find it. Oh, it's, it's later on in the presentation. Let me just move it up. And I'll play it for you guys. There we go. Bill's self-confidence has really increased, especially when he's in public. He uses it certainly at home as well, and with the family and with friends, but especially going out in public, it makes a huge difference. Would you agree? Yes, sir. To make a communication aid that's so simple, yet so capable, you really have to listen to your users. Users like Bill Scott, a man I met two years ago, who suffered a stroke that left him unable to speak. Do you want to show them in your iPhone there, Bill? Show them in my voice what you have programmed. I had my stroke on the subway on the way to work. I was unable to move when I got to the stop where I was supposed to get off. Like lots of people, he used a communication aid that was big, expensive, and difficult to use. And this is a long-term trend. If you go back five years, you go back 10 years, you see the same thing. Technology was getting better, but communication aids weren't. And for the two million families in North America, living with communication challenges like autism and aphasia, an alternative was desperately needed. And now we've made that alternative. We call it My Voice. It's an opportunity for him to share with others, yeah. which he had difficulty doing before. Alicia is my daughter. Denny is my son-in-law. The huge breakthrough that we had was to introduce web technology to communication aids. With an interactive website that enhances and customizes your communication aid, My Voice is able to do incredible things, like suggest relevant vocabulary based on your current location. At the coffee shop, your personal coffee order is at your fingertips. At the movie theater, you'll get relevant words and phrases to make good conversation. You're going to love this movie. Hugh Grant is dreamy. Simply drag and drop vocabulary from any web browser anywhere in the world. And with the bookshelf, users can add high quality content in seconds. For instance, I'm into basketball, so I would want to add the basketball book to my vocabulary. You see, my voice syncs instantly over the internet, so you can program it from across the room or across the country. Finally, friends and relatives can take part in their loved one's care no matter where they are in the world. And my voice just looks great. It's fun, it's bright, it's colorful, it's a joy to use. And now, my voice runs on both Apple and Android devices, so users can pick the hardware that's right for them from dozens of great options. I was blown away by my voice. It absolutely met so many deficits that I had in current research with other applications I was using. Some children have no verbal communication. My voice gives them a chance to really cross into a little closer to our world where we have words and voices. They now have my voice on these platforms that they can touch a button and have the device speak their desires for them. This is transformative. This is something that will fully enfranchise people. This is something that is human rights technology as much as it is voice technology. This is an enabling, barrier-breaking piece of science that's really critically important and will just make, make a huge difference in so many people's lives. I'm hoping my voice is very successful because it will teach people the value of these investments. Possibly the best thing about my voice is it will always be free to try. During development, we've heard countless stories of families and individuals that could really benefit from communication aids, but they simply don't have the insurance or finances to afford them. My voice will always be free to try. When I started on the little first beginning piece of this project, I never thought it would amount to anything. And now, everywhere we go, people say, when can I use this with my family member, with my student, with my patient? In the coming months, the coming years, my voice is just going to keep getting better and better. With the best features people have ever seen, giving them the best conversations they've ever had. Just try. Isn't that a great video? <laughs> I mean, I... <laughs>
I mean, I know it's our video, but it, it's, just, it's just a great video. I uh, just love it. Um, so, so that's that's basically a really good overview of what of what my voice is all about. And so, just to briefly give you a sense of of the app itself, so this will help put the design advice I'm going to give you into context. I'm just going to tell you some of the main things that that we do in terms of the application itself. So, one of the main things that we do that you saw in the video is that we allow people to do instant remote customization. Uh, a challenge with traditional uh, devices can be that they often require you to plug them in, to transfer files, to manage them on a computer using special software. This can be a pretty daunting thing. And when we visit clinics like Toronto Rehab's uh, AAC clinic on Dunn Avenue, uh, they tell us that they spend dozens of hours for each user doing this kind of customization. Instead, what we let you do is log in. So let's say you have a friend or relative that has a speech or language impairment, and you can edit their vocabulary, and what you see on your, on your website is exactly what will appear on their device instantly. So big advantage there. Um, we also have this very cool location awareness feature. This was the one that sort of started the project and got us a lot of these initial grants. And the idea is very simple. The idea is one of the reasons that existing uh, communication aids can be difficult to use is because they organize words and phrases hierarchically. So I'll give you an example of why this is challenging. Suppose you go to a movie theater and you want to use the word movie, seats, and popcorn. Okay? Now each of these are often grouped in semantically distinct categories. So movie is going to be under media, seats is going to be under popcorn, uh, sorry, seats is going to be under furniture, and popcorn is going to be under food, let's say. So you're constantly traversing these different folders. That takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to do. What if instead we could use all the various sensors in this device and detect where you are to generate a vocabulary on the fly on a server that's relevant to that location and send it to you? So a lot of what Yuta was talking about, about the, the value of cloud computing, this is sort of a, a, a very specific practice case study of where you can use that to instantly improve the, the quality of, of communication of, of people with speech and language disabilities. Um, another thing that, that's very important to our users is the, is the ability to speak in a way that sounds like how they want to sound, right? So we offer different voices, male voices, female voices, and with different accents. Let me show you. I'll show you a, a, a female British accent right here. I'll just, I'll just flip into it. It's, it's frankly, it's very posh and, and refined, and you'll, you'll see. Hello, my name is Kate. All right. And uh, let me, let's let's uh, let's make her say some stuff, right? So we'll say. I live in Toronto. You know, or she might talk about. My dog Spot. Pretty cool, <laughs> right? So so that's very important to people, and that's one of the features we emphasized in this version. Um, we also. Uh, created the ability for people to add what we call vocab books. So a lot of people are interested in the same things, basketball, movies, novels, cooking, that kind of stuff. But each individual is having to go ahead and add all these things over and over again for themselves. How great would it be if they had a compendium, a collection of these books that they could then just drag and drop onto their device and they're there instantly. So that's, those are some of the things that we add. So the, the, the sort of final thing that we do that's a bit unique is uh, automatic, uh, automatic backup. So uh, a lot of existing devices, uh, there's not always backup support, or where it exists, it can be very complex, involves a lot of file management. And of course, you might imagine uh, children and adults alike can lose and break devices like this pretty commonly, right? Now, when they do on traditional devices, it's often the case that they also lose their words and phrases. And that's a, that's a big loss if you're going for weeks or months without getting back all the things you want to say about all the people you want to say them about. So what we do is we use the wireless internet as we're using in all these other features to just constantly back up what you're doing seamlessly in the background. There's not even a button for it. Um, and so when you, let's say, break a phone like this, God forbid, you get another one, you just type in your account and all your stuff's back. So again, the ability of servers to supplement uh, assistive technology. So what are the design ideas that went into my voice? So what sort of our, our secret sauce, if you like? So we have some, uh, some sort of strong opinions about, about, about design for, for devices like this that really just came organically out of what we did. None of us were specifically trained in this area. We all got into this project as people from computer science, engineering, even my undergrad degree is in political science. So we all sort of learned these things uh, in different ways. So the first thing I want to tell you about is that assistive technology doesn't have to be ugly, right? There's a, the, if you look at a lot, of, a lot of assistive technology devices out there, a lot of people's first reactions that haven't seen them before is, wow, who designed that interface? Now, some are very good, but not all are. And one thing that you'll see very commonly is really good elements of traditional design for consumer electronics, like good typography, clever use of icons, positioning, spacing, colors, often go out the window because a lot of people, either consciously or unconsciously, assume that good design is not important to people with disabilities. They assume that you know, sexy interfaces are for consumer electronics, you know, and rarely do you have someone look at assistive technology and say, wow, that looks as, as great or better than what I just saw on this iPad, right? You know, the interface there, something from Apple or Sony or the, the latest electronics, that's rare. And we don't think that that's a good thing. When you have somebody for whom 
a device like this is their voice. It's their entire, it's their sole means of expression. And, and speaking to those around them, they're using it for hours and hours a day. So it's all the more important than even a standard device if you only use an hour or two a day, that, that we might, that it is beautiful, easy to use, attractive, and that people are proud to use it. So as you saw in those screenshots, we've strived to make something that looks attractive for anybody, not just special needs consumers or consumers with disabilities, but all consumers, right? So we think that's very important to emphasize to people starting their own designs, right? Try and make it beautiful, try and design it to the highest standard, not just for a lower, a lower perceived standard for the specific audience. Uh, the second sort of design advice I want to give you is that you should get personal with your users. Now, this seems like pretty obvious advice, but I can't emphasize how important it is. So in this case, you saw Bill and Bonnie Scott in this video, and there was an enormous range of things that we learned from them that we couldn't have learned otherwise. So you can read a lot of blogs about this stuff. You can read a lot of books about this stuff. But generally, uh, the, the thing I'll say is you'll learn way more by spending an hour or a day with somebody who really li lives with these different disabilities. So we, we had a bunch of interesting experiences with Bill. Uh, for instance, one of the things that we noticed very quickly as he started using My Voice in the earlier versions is he started adding uh, children's books in order to tell bedtime stories to his grandkids. Right? This was the inspiration for the bookshelf feature. Right? We also noticed that he started adding way more words and phrases than we expected, not hundreds, thousands and thousands and thousands in, 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 in very distinct categories, right? Um, and so that led to us wanting to make this really great editing interface to make it a lot easier for Bill. And finally, we also noticed that he was putting in the menus of every single restaurant you could ever think of, right? <laughs> so, you know, Subway, McDonald's, and so, and so on, right? And of course, the, the obvious thing that you quickly realize is he's having to scroll through each and every one of these to find the one at that given time. That's pretty laborious. And it can also be uh, pretty difficult if you're standing in line at Timmy's and you've got people queuing up behind you. It's, it's hard enough having challenges communicating, but also feeling like you're holding up people behind you. So instead we thought, make it location aware, detect you're at the Timmy's, right? And say, Timbits, double, double, right? Pretty simple idea, but they all came out of those personal experiences. And, there, and there's, you simply can't skip it and get the same results. The sort of other side of that is that there's also no substitute for domain expertise. So my fellow speakers probably appreciate this idea as domain experts, but what, what I'll tell you is that it's very important as well to not just have the personal experience, but to also meet the people who've spent, spent their careers in this area, people who have you know P PhDs in related areas, people who've really studied this intensively. Um, and you don't necessarily uh, ha ha have to have to have someone on staff all the time, but to have people that you can go to and access. So I actually don't have a picture of, uh, of our research, uh, our, two, our two researchers that are under project, so I'm just going to show this picture here, Professor Farnsworth from Futurama. Um, sure they'll forgive me. So, so there's two people on the project uh, that, that have that experience that are particularly valuable to us. So one is Professor Rhonda McEwen, who you saw in the video, and she's done a lot of work uh, with children on the autism spectrum. And she taught us a lot of things that we wouldn't otherwise have realized about design. One very practical one is she told us about how oftentimes children, uh, children with autism uh, and also children with certain other disabilities can often have difficulty simply with the action of tapping. Right? That actually it's something that takes a, a great deal of motor control that it, that's actually quite a hard behavior to learn sometimes. And she explained that many, uh, many of the students that she had worked with in her studies actually swipe at the screen. Right? So this has led us to reevaluate if we can create new interfaces that recognize swiping as a form of input and try and recognize the intention behind that swiping. Um, an another person that we have that works on the project uh, is, is a woman named uh, Alexandra Carling Rowland, who joined us recently and is helping us with our aphasia work. And she comes from, from, from 20 years of, of experience dealing with, with people, particularly with aphasia, but with a range of speech and language difficulties. Uh, and, and having her on the project and her ability to tell us very things, for, for instance, I'll give you one, one thing that we didn't know before. A lot of people that have aphasia, we tend to assume that they just have a speech and language disorder. But it's oftentimes the case that if someone's had, for instance, a stroke, they also have comorbid disabilities and symptoms that affect them in other ways. So for instance, a common thing is what's called visual field neglect. So many people that have aphasia also have difficulty perceiving part of their field of vision, right? Now, in many cases, they're not, nece they're not necessarily aware that they can't perceive it. A story that we were told was a person uh, at a rehab clinic who was served dinner, ate half the plate, right? And, he, and you know, they asked, how, you know, how was your meal? And he said it was good, but it wasn't very much. They turned the plate around and he goes, oh, right? Pretty, pretty startling story, but it also has really strong implications for how you design an interface. How do you design an interface to include people that might not be able to see parts of it? Right? How do you detect and work with that? So those are things that are coming out of those insights. The final thing that I'll tell you, and this is sort of the big idea 
behind my voice, and actually I think has a lot of interesting parallels with what Yuta presented earlier. And this is our theory that anticipatory interfaces are, are more accessible interfaces. So in other words, that our, our sort of uh, motivating idea is that if you can anticipate on the fly the needs of the person using your device, you can actually make it more inclusive. So let's go back to that location aware example. So some of our users will also have uh, intellectual disabilities, right? So sometimes separating all of these words into very specific semantic categories can be something that poses some barriers to some of our users. But instead, if you have a paradigm like location awareness where you show up at a movie theater and the words that you were trying to get to at the movie theater right there automatically, that opens it up to a lot more people people who would have a hard time expressing those same things otherwise. And we're doing that by using these clever technologies backed by server-based uh, kind of services in the cloud, if you like, to make uh, uh, interfaces that are increasingly anticipatory. Right? And it doesn't just have to stop there. There's lots of other ways you can anticipate people's needs based on the sensing that, that's in these devices and, and monitoring usage. And we think that makes them more accessible. So those are our sort of four, uh, four main ideas. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. If you're interested in us, uh, we, we have a public launch in a, in a few days. You can visit us at myvoiceaac.com. And next week, you'll be able to download it in both the App Store and for your Android devices. Uh, it's free to try, so please check it out. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions for Alex? Got a few minutes, yeah? Um, just wondering, the trend in the App Store, yeah. course, the Apple App Store, yeah. is, is um, low price points, which have been phenomenal in right. making a lot of people incredibly wealthy. The trend in traditional rehab, mm -hmm. putting out those ugly boxes, and yes. I can't even emphasize, and, but I'd love to reinforce what you're talking about. Yes. Um, we should tie it into where you get your funding from, the yep. fact that your funding is medically oriented. We can't possibly find an iPhone. Right. And all that. So anyway, I'm fascinated to see what you've Thank done, you. where you're going. This is fabulous. But Thank you. one question, some of the augmented communication devices coming out for the iPhone yep. are keeping the steep prices yes. that have been traditional. Yes. Where are you at with your price range? What's your strategy? And you talked a little bit about the curb cut metaphor that you referred to mm -hmm. in that these technologies and apps for can be good for everybody, depending yes. on how you frame that. So where are that's you going? Right. You know, that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a bit about our pricing. So the first thing is, we couldn't agree more. We were stunned when we first got into this area to see the cost of existing devices. I didn't hammer on it too much in this presentation, but some of them, as, as you well know, are between ten and $20,000. A lot of these are, right? And even where there is insurance that covers it, the deductibles for many people are still huge. And particularly when many people with disabilities have more limited incomes because of the nature of their disability, that's a lot of money to ask from people. Right? And there's also one other thing that we thought was particularly pernicious about it, and that's that it forces people generally to take a leap of faith into a device. So a story that we heard very often is a, a person shows up at a clinic, they've had a stroke, their family says, what do we do? The person at the clinic says, well, you should have this one, right? And they say, well, what do I do? You know, what do I do? And they feel pressure, and they go and they jump in. So they spend, let's say, let's say they spend a deductible in the States might be around five or $8,000 on, on one of the really high-end ones, maybe. It varies jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So they pay that, and they start using it for a few weeks or months, only to find that it doesn't suit them. Now, the problem was, because that cost was so high, they weren't able to try before they bought. So we're trying to take a pricing model with my voice that addresses that issue as the primary issue. So we're making the app completely free, right? So everything that, everything that you saw on this app, completely free to try on both those stores. What we want to charge instead for is all those clever services. We say the ability to have, you know, the ability basically to take out a device and speak, that's basic, you get it for free. We're going to give you the really cool advanced stuff and we're going to charge a low monthly fee. Right, like a subscription in the ring. You're doing an in-app model where where you say I want to have a server fat for the other. You tackle that on off, and there's a monthly fee or what? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, people sign up for an account, uh, and and they would be billed monthly as long as they're using those services. And that'd be something that's very low. We're thinking somewhere around thirty dollars a month, but we're actually for the next six months even making the service free, and we're going to poll people and ask them what they think is a price that people in their communities could afford. Uh, yes, Utah. Are you uh, talking to the assistive devices program here in, in Ontario? Yeah. One of the ironies, of course, is that yes. 
uh, it has to be specialized AT. They do not fund standard devices. That's right. Which is a, a fairly strange policy and, yes. and costs the <laughs> taxpayer quite a bit of money because, yes. of course, uh, commodity devices are far less expensive than cannabis. Okay, there's a solution for that. You do put uh, all the, all the um, old boys have been doing. You, you, you get from plastic and you yep. wrap the iPhone in the plastic. Yeah. So you have your custom device and you yeah. add on another two or three thousand bucks. Absolutely. So, so just the, the reference for, for, for the video, I realize I should do that as well. Is that the question? The question is: Are, are we looking into uh, programs such as the assistive devices program in Ontario, which helps supplement those costs? And isn't it silly that existing regulations generally don't have in mind the idea of using commodity hardware with specialized software and force you it, to use specialized hardware, which is very expensive? So I, I completely agree with you, Yuta. Which is everybody is quickly realizing that this model is actually dramatically cheaper for insurers and governments and so on. It's also dramatically better because there's more choice. Um, and also, it's a lot easier to rapidly iterate and develop on something like this, which is designed to receive software updates wirelessly, rather than boxes which often don't have upgradability, period. And those that do, it's very it's very arduous to do so. So what our hope is, is we, we've got a, an upcoming study uh, that we've been planning with uh, Toronto Rehab's uh, uh, AAC clinic on Dunn Avenue, with the Aphasia Institute, uh, and possibly, though this is just in the works right now, uh, also with Sunnybrook. And that Toronto Rehab Clinic can actually submit us for approval in that program. But, but there are, of course, challenges just based on the nature of, of the device. Long story short, our hope is that as people see how compelling something like this is and how cost effective something like this is, legislators want to start to change this. Insurers in places where there's private insurers want to start extending support for this and that everybody really will benefit by it. So it's one of those great economic case studies. It would be wonderful if this is the wedge that oh, yeah? finally changes mm -hmm. that. Definitely. That's the hope. Uh, any other questions? All right. Good. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank impressive. you all so much. So this kind of thing is really exciting for Mars because it allows us to work with a number of different partners to try to affect change, uh, not only in you know business development for a singular company, but uh, to change an entire industry or an entire platform. Um, and just something Alexander said about his friend Bill there who had the stroke, you know, now he's got in there the menus of his restaurants and he can interact with those restaurants and get be part of the kind of the economic uh, cycle of the province in a much easier way and it's that's the kind of thing we're talking about where the studies show that this is good for everybody uh, not just because it feels good but because people can make a lot of money off it you know th there's a real opportunity there so I really want to thank our three speakers uh, and uh, thank you all for coming and uh, encourage you to check out the AOD website and the websites of our of our speakers here this video uh, the PowerPoint presentations and uh, some tips, some hot tips videos that they're going to be filming after will be up on the Mars website in the next two weeks. So I encourage you to check that out too. Thanks very much.